it seemed like the find of a lifetime. I couldn't believe it was just sitting in a little basket in a garage sale marked five dollars. It was one early weekday morning last March and the Methodist women's garage sale was supposed to open the next day. So since I was the first one in the building that day, I figured I would wander around the fellowship hall just to see what they had. I could find any long lost treasures or something. Who knows? You hear about them finding ancient Egyptian artifacts or long lost Rembrandt paintings in garage sales. Well, why not in Mont Bellevue, Texas? You never know. So I'm walking up and down the aisles, looking at the books and the trinkets and just piles of stuff. And I'm about to head out and I notice something. It's a, a basket filled with watches. And they are right there on top. I couldn't believe it. Was not one, but two Rolex watches. One even looked like it was a presidential Rolex. It had diamond numbers and diamond encrusted bevels. Sean with the fall out of the pew. He knows what I'm talking about here. I couldn't believe it. It was sitting in this basket marked $5. So I whipped out my phone and I started Googling really quick. Each one is worth a good bit of money, but the presidential Rolex, well, that's a good chunk of change. Not the $5 it was marked. We couldn't sell it for that. This had to go straight to a jeweler and be appraised and be sold. The Methodist women were going to have so much cash. This was a prized possession worth a small fortune. I just started imagining all the different projects they could do with this money. Oh, it was just such a win, like winning the lottery. I stuck both watches in my pocket and, and waited for the food pantry volunteers to show up. I knew that Marilyn and Gloria would just have to see this. I knew they would thank me. They'd be so grateful for their preacher who found these in the, the $5 bed at the garage sale. I would be a hero. Look what our preacher saved for us. So I saw them pull up and I ran out to the chapel. Look what I found. Someone put it in the cheap basket. Can you believe it? It's a presidential Rolex. Look at the diamonds all over. Look how fancy. Do you know what this thing is worth? I just Googled it. Look at my phone. Look how much this thing is worth. Not $5. Which volunteer did this? Then Marilyn took it in her hand, and she's been to turn it over and look at it. And then she began to laugh at me. She said, oh, William, honey, these are fake. I said, how do you know they're fake? She goes, because I donated them. <laughs> they're junk. We'll be lucky to get $5 for them. I was crushed. I'm still crushed. <laughs> I thought I had something real. I thought I had something authentic, something genuine. But it was fake. It was fake. It was junk. It was worthless. I imagine James feeling the same way when he wrestled with the news that these Jewish Christians, these brothers and sisters of his, which if you remember from last week, had likely left Jerusalem for other cities and countries around the Mediterranean due to ongoing persecution in Jerusalem, that he's wrestling with the news that these Jewish Christians were being lured away from the faith by the riches of this world and the ways of their culture, while also being oppressed by the rich and by those at the top of the social ladder. But even more concerning is it seems like there was some false teachers out there, or maybe just false teaching within the wider church that threatened to drag these Christians away from the faith as well. Because as James writes, he takes particular aim at his sisters and brothers who believe that faith is much more about what we believe than what we do. They've created a false divide, a, a false dichotomy between faith and works, leading to Christians who profess their faith on Sunday morning, who believe in God, who affirm the creed at their baptism, but then live like the pagans the other six days of the week. Their beliefs have not changed how they live. 
And as we saw last Sunday, James goes so far as to basically question if they're even saved. He worries that they are deceiving themselves into thinking they are really disciples of Jesus. Now I realize this is a tough word, especially for our church, because we spent well over a year, or basically a year, grappling with whether or not our church should disaffiliate from our previous denomination. We, we wrestled with and prayed about and talked about what we believe and what we believe the scripture says and what we believe the creed says. We spent so much time talking about right belief, about, about orthodoxy. But now James wants us to know that right belief must result in right living. The two cannot be separated from each other. Our lives must be the clearest evidence of what we believe or our beliefs are for nothing. But now as we look at chapter 2, we need to see that James doubles down on what he's saying. First, by condemning their, these people's, these churches' preferential treatment, their display of overt favoritism toward the rich in their congregation. In doing this, they are mistreating the poor among them. They're treating the poor as less than worthy, as less than the children of God that they are. So they're violating the royal law, as James calls it, by not loving their neighbor as themselves. That's the royal law, and they are breaking it over and over again. And by not loving their poor neighbors, by their refusal to show mercy to the poor among them, they are proving, James says, that their faith is actually dead. These Christians talk a lot about their rich, authentic faith and their deep trust in God. They talk a lot about how they read the scriptures, about how they believe all the right things, but by their mistreatment of the poor, their confessions are empty. Their faith is actually just a shell, a husk, an empty affirmation. They say they are filled with the Spirit, but really they aren't. They're actually a body without a spirit. They are dead. If James were writing to us today, he'd probably say something like, you guys know a lot about Jesus, but you don't know Jesus. And that's because true faith in Christ, true living faith is a verb. Faith is a verb. It's a way of life. Like our mission statement here at the church about a living relationship with Jesus. It's about a whole way of living where we are guided by holy love. My high school math teacher, when she caught someone messing around or playing with her phone or just not taking notes during her lecture, would say, math is not a spectator sport. Neither is Christianity. Christianity, faith, is not a spectator sport either. Checking Christian on a form does not make you a Christian. Just believing the right things doesn't make you a Christian. Because as James says, even the demons believe in God, but they shudder in fear. If our beliefs are not changing our behavior, if they're not changing the way we live, if they're not changing how we love, if they're not changing how we think about our money, about our relationships, about our priorities, about our calendars, our politics, our jobs, then we are in danger of becoming a body without a spirit. Amen. To further this point, James starts talking about some concrete examples. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, be well fed but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Well, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Does anyone else, when reading this or hearing this, does anyone else hear the parable of the Good Samaritan? 
James is so good at drawing on the teachings of Jesus without even explicitly mentioning Jesus. If you remember back to the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus is confronted by a, a teacher of the law, and he, Jesus responds by telling a story about a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going by down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite came to the place and saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for all extra expenses that you may have. This Samaritan, this man who would have been considered an enemy of the Jews in Jesus' day, put his faith into action. He upheld the royal law, the law of love, and showed mercy to someone in need, even going so far as to put his own money on the line. But how often do we... When we see someone in need, a friend, a family member, a church member, a colleague, a guy on the corner of I-10 and 146, how often do we respond with thoughts and prayers? This is what happens after national tragedies, too. Preachers and politicians alike default to thoughts and prayers. Now hear me very clearly, very clearly, prayers are essential and powerful. Never, ever give up on prayer. Never, ever dispense with prayer. But if our prayers and our expressions of concern, no matter how sincere, cannot meet the needs of the naked and the hungry, if our faith is unaccompanied by tangible evidence of its reality, if our prayers do not move our feet, then what good is any of it? What good is any of it? All of them then, both our concerns and our faith are inadequate and our deadless, our deedless faith is dead. One of my favorite TV shows of all time is The West Wing. Yeah, I'm that kind of nerd. I think I've seen it all the way through three times, but I've seen other episodes even more than that. But there's this one scene that always sticks with me. It's from the season two Christmas episode. And Josh, the deputy chief of staff, is struggling with PTSD after being shot at the season finale of the earlier season. His boss, Leo McGarry, the White House chief of staff, comes to him and tells him a story. He says this guy is walking down the street when he falls in a hole. The walls are so steep that he can't get out and soon a doctor passes by. And the guy shouts up, hey, you, can you help me out? The doctor writes a prescription and throws it into the hole. A priest comes along and the guy shouts up, father, I'm down in this hole. Can you help me out? The priest writes out a prayer and throws it down the hole. Then a friend walks by. Hey, Joe, it's me. Can you help me out? And the friend jumps in the hole. He says, are you stupid? Now we're both stuck down here. And the friend says, yeah, but I've been down here before, and I know the way out. See, Leo knew the truth. Genuine, authentic faith is not something that exists in one's head. It lives in our everyday walking around life, or it doesn't live at all. Faith is a tangible action that produces the visible evidence that what was invisible can now be seen. This means following Jesus' example, who having seen our need, came down from heaven to live among us and to serve us. He came to work on our behalf and to free us from the chains that bind us. He was willing to pour out his life and his love on our behalf. And that same grace should evoke a response within us. 
We should desire nothing more than to follow his lead, to jump in that hole and to be agents of grace to those in need around us. As Methodists, this should be part of our DNA. This is part of our DNA. Where Martin Luther and several other early Protestant, gener- Protestant leaders struggled with James's teachings on faith and works, thinking they were in opposition to what Paul says in Galatians and elsewhere about being saved by faith and not by works. John Wesley didn't have that problem. He knew what James and Paul were both getting at. John Wesley believed that good works were and are the fruit of faith. Good works are the fruit of faith. And authentic faith must necessarily produce fruit. He understood that faith has the power to make a real difference in human life. We can see that in Wesley's life, from collecting money for the poor to setting up missions to distribute food and clothing to providing homes for widows and orphans to opening schools for the poorest children in London. And that same spirit, later Methodists, founded hospitals, like in Houston. Houston Methodist was created by the Methodist church, by Methodist congregations to serve the needy and the poor in a growing Houston that was really kind of tough to live in. And in all of these cases, faith served as a verb. Faith was a verb. It worked to share the mercy that we had been given and change the lives of those around us. But I'll be honest with y'all. I am still worried that we Americans, especially we evangelical Protestants, have gone all in on easy faith. The kind of Christianity that is easy to hold, easy to claim, but doesn't mean much in terms of life. Gallup and other pollsters have consistently shown the great chasm that exists between what people say they believe and how such beliefs actually change and affect their lives and their choices. The spiritual commitment of the evangelical community of recent years has often been characterized as a mile wide and an inch deep. Plus, in light of the huge number of people in North America who claim to be born again, approaching as much as a quarter of the population in North America, we have to wonder why there seems to be so little effect on the culture around us. But this realization only makes the words of James all the more important today. Real, genuine faith is manifested by true repentance, by a change of heart and mind, and the easily documented evidence of a new way of life. We as evangelical Christians cannot keep claiming huge numbers of of conversions without also a corresponding increase in the fruit of righteousness and holiness. For along with our personal transformation, the hungry are also fed, where the poor are also lifted up, and where the oppressed are also set free. Those things must go together. This is our calling as Christians. This is our calling as Christians who look to Jesus and cry, Lord, Lord. And this is our heritage as Methodists who claim the mantle of John Wesley. The people of Mont Bellevue are looking to us, this church, looking for our fruit. But what will they find? Will they find a church that has turned inward, that is more concerned about what happens within its walls rather than outside its walls? Will the need of its members outrank the needs of its community? Will they find a church that believes all the right things but has a counterfeit faith? Will they find a church that is dead inside because the Spirit of the Lord has left us? Or will they find a church that is producing a harvest of 10, 50, even 100 fold? A church that is turned outward in love and grace? A church that is faith that is authentic? A church that is alive in Christ and filled with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit? Which kind of church will they find? And hear me tell you, there is only one right answer. So choose wisely. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.